Good morning, good morning, good morning. I would like to echo uh, Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. What a tremendous honor to be a mom. Us dads think we're pretty cool, but I think we all know where the allegiances lie at our houses, right? Where do the kids go when they need something? They go to mom. Uh, I found this for a mom's job description, and I thought it was appropriate. There's a whole bunch of stuff on there, alarm clock, banker, correctional officer, disc jockey, expectation manager, I like that one. Where's the uh, lost and found attendant? That was my personal favorite. And uh, my wife knows where everything's at in her house, and if she doesn't know where it's at, then it is not in the house anymore. So <laughs> I believe personally one of the major errors of our current culture has been the de-emphasis on moms in the last 20, 30 years. And again, we, to, we like to take things too far, right? What started out as a good thing, women should have equal opportunities to have a career, should be treated fairly, there should be those opportunities you know, went too far to be where all of a sudden career was valued more than the moms uh, staying at home. And maybe you've heard this in the past. Well, I'm just a stay-at-home mom. And I would say, don't say that. Don't say that. A stay-at-home mom is a a tremendous uh, benefit to our society and our families. You aren't just a mom. You are a mom. And I'm so grateful personally that my wife has been able to stay home It's worked out tremendously great for us. She's with the kids all day, and we don't really regret one day of having that opportunity for her to really be the primary voice uh, in our families. And if God's called you to work, that's awesome too. If you have a job, find something you love to do, do it as for the Lord, but don't discount the value of motherhood at the expense of career. And I enjoy my job. I like going to work vast majority of the time, but there's a lot of days I leave and I'm just jealous. We homeschool most of the kids. And I just am jealous for the time that my wife gets all day at home with my kids, just being with them and teaching them. And we all know it involves a ton of mundane tasks. It's a lot of work. If I had a time machine, I don't think I would go back to the toddler years. We're out of that now. Uh, But the impact my wife, really all of you moms has had, is just immeasurable. Um, Stay-at-home moms, working moms, single moms, you guys are all awesome. And don't let anyone tell you differently. Um, We're going to continue in Ephesians today. Trevor covered righteousness, righteous living last week. I hope it encouraged you. I hope it convicted you in some areas as well, too. It did me. Uh, These next two teachings are really a continuation of that. Um, Let's pray before we get into the word here. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for Sunday. We thank you for rain. We thank you for warmer weather. We pray, Lord, this wind would just die down and go away, Lord. We just have a beautiful spring. And Lord, I do just thank you for, Lord, all the moms that are here today and all the uh, children that have the benefit of having, uh, Lord, just someone that loves them and cares for them unconditionally, and or what a picture we see of, uh, Lord, the way you love us and the way our moms love us, and Lord, we just, uh, we pray today would just be a day of peace uh, in our homes and um, a day of rest for the moms as well, too, and Lord, we pray just open our word up to you, Lord, I pray today we would, um, Lord, filter through your word and the way you'd like us to, Lord, help us just to uh, put down any barriers we might have, and Lord, just hear from you today, Lord. I pray these words would be yours. Um, Lord, you just guide us to where you want us to go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, remember the chapter headings in the Bible are not from God. Those are from man-made, and we are in Ephesians 5. And if you want to open your Bibles, if you have them, most of the time that this passage starts in verse 22, because that's where the heading starts. But I think we've got to go back a verse first before we go move forward. Verse Ephesians 5.21, we're going to start there. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh Uh-oh, some guards just went up out there, I would guess. Last week we did sex, drugs, and rock and roll and booze, and now this week we're doing submission. That's okay, we're going to go in. One of the primary benefits of teaching through the word, verse by verse, is that it allows us to really go into some of these conversations that... um, I don't know, maybe controversial, maybe hard, or maybe can be taken out of context. And we do teach topical as well, too, which is good. We like to do that, so you can cover a topic. Um, but there is a lot of value in verse by verse. And I would tell you, in my heart, you have two options today. Two options. Option A, you can take your beliefs, your thoughts, your opinions, your ideas, your understanding, and you can filter God's word through that. That's option A. Or... Option B, you can take God's word, this Bible, and you can let the word 
filter your beliefs, your thoughts, your options, your understanding. And that choice is up to you today as you listen through this. I would submit this is really the essence of what it means to move from being a believer. I know who Christ is. I believe he died for me. I acknowledge that. To actually being a disciple is taking the word at its value and then saying, hey, what am I going to do with this? Um, Isaiah 30, 21. Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I've always liked that verse. The word is going to guide and direct our steps, and it will guide and direct your steps to today in this area. 2 Timothy 2.15, this is NASB and not ESV, says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handing the word of truth. The King Jimmy actually says study instead of diligent. I like that a little bit better. Study to present yourself approved. We study what's in the Bible so we can handle it appropriately, and then we obey what we find. Bonhoeffer said, one act of obedience is worth more than 100 sermons. So that's the context I want to give you when you go through this to maybe put the guard down a little bit and say, oh, I've heard about the submission thing, I don't like it. I think it's wrong. Um, let's, let's work through it. So verse 21, again, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit and everything to their husbands. We're going to get to the husband second, but we're going to stay with the wives here for a minute. Remember that, okay, we talked through that. Where does submission start? Our first error is assuming that submission starts in verse 22 with wives. It doesn't start there. It starts back in 21. Submitting to one another. How? Out of reverence for Christ. God gave, Christ died. While we were still his enemy, he died for each one of you, for you and for me. And before we go into the specifics of this role in the husband and wife and submission, we have to remember the root of submission is out of reverence for Christ. And we submit to one another. The second error looks at one side only and says, well, wives, do what your husband tells you to. That is not biblical submission. That, you don't see that anywhere. An honest reading of the text makes that abundantly clear. We submit to one another out of our reverence for Christ. We do see here, though, the woman's role is to submit to her husband. As to what? As to the Lord. No, there is nothing in this passage that says or even implies that the woman is worthless, is somehow inferior, or is not valued by God. Christianity has done more to improve the rights of women than any other institution in all of human history since the beginning of time. We go all the way back to Genesis 127. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Created together. Perfect. 1 Peter 3, 7 talks about men and women being heirs together. So we see equality here, but we do see different roles for husbands and wives in the Bible. Does that mean one role is better than the other? It doesn't. They're different. Tell you a secret, men and women are different too. That's okay. It's okay to be different. Tell your neighbor they're different. Say, you're different. Say, you're different. <laughs> Hopefully you're not offended by that. That's okay that we're different. We don't all have to be the same. And it's not better, it's not worse. Equally valued in, in words of God. All right, I've got a video queued up that I think exemplifies this, and so we'll see if the technology works here for us. Would you like to learn to tango, Donna? Right now? I'm offering you my services, free of charge. What do you say? Uh, I think I'd be a little afraid. Of what? Afraid of making a mistake. No mistakes in the tango, Donna. Not like life. Simple. That's what makes the tango so great. If you make a mistake, you get all tangled up. Just tangle on. Why don't you try? We try it? All right, I'll give it a try. Hold me down, son. Your arm. 
Charlie. I'm gonna need some coordinates here, son. Uh, your, the floor's about 20 by 30, and uh, you're at the long end. There's some tables on the outside, and uh, the, the band's on the right. That dance would not be much fun without one person, would it? And how would it work if both of those partners were trying to lead? It would not work at all. Could you do it without both of them? No, so you have one leading and one following, and then together it makes this beautiful, some of the parts are better than the holes. This is where it takes two to tango. That's what they were doing. That song will be stuck in your head all day now, because it's been in mind all week. What I especially like about this version is, hopefully you picked it up, Colonel Frank Slade, uh, he won an Oscar for this, Pacino did, he's blind. So that's part of the thing. He's a, he's a flawed leader. Maybe you would not pick him out. Hey, if I got to have somebody lead, maybe I don't want the blind guy leading. But it was his role, so he stepped out into it. Well, we filter this passage we read today through our experience first, or we start with the word and apply it. I know women, some of you out there are more qualified to teach on this topic than I am. You all know women that would likely lead their family better than the men do. But this command that we just saw is not qualified with expertise or competency or efficiency or effectiveness. The husband's the head of the wife and the wife is called to submit to it. So what's that mean? Remember, we start from Christ. How did Christ lead? Matthew 20, 28 said, even as the Son of Man came to, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's where we start from. The command of the wife is rooted in Christ's love, even as Christ is head of the church. While the respective roles that God given us, those are not qualified, the submission is qualified, right? It is qualified in Christ. We are given an example uh, and a calling to follow. The creator of the universe came to earth as a man, modeled how he wants us to live in community with one another. That alone is an unbelievable fact that we can just gloss over sometimes. The creator came down and he gave us a way to follow. Long before he got to the cross, he came to show us the way he wanted us to love one another. He was love personified. He showed compassion, care, comfort in each interaction he had. And that's the model that we're looking for. I use the Jesus from The Chosen. If you haven't seen The Chosen, I... Personally, I can be a little strong in opinions. I, I don't like most of the Christian movies. Uh, honestly, they get a little lame sometimes, and they're a little heavy-fisted and ham-handed. And so sometimes when the recommendation is, oh, you should go watch this, it's like, hmm, I don't know if I want to invest my time. And uh, one of the other pastors had sent this chosen around, hey, you guys should watch this. And, and we did, and it's fantastic. And what I love the most about it is it really shows God, Jesus is a human, as a human, and he was... He was funny, and he was interesting, and he interacted with people. And we get the care in the Bible, but it brings this whole, he really was a man that experienced life. So if you haven't seen The Chosen yet, I would encourage you guys. It really, it stirred up our faith. You can watch it as a family um, and really enjoyed it. And that's what we see here from this part. It's not, it's not a domineering submission, or it's not, a, it's not a woman with no rights. It's this beautiful love and compassion, and how Christ loved is then how we love each other. 
And if that was our only passage today, I don't know how much fun this would be, but we have more to read, and this is the time for the men, and the men's part of this is way longer and way more involved than the women's. The women's part is actually, in a way, uh, a little bit simpler. So men, pay attention to this next part. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How do we love our wives as Christ did? Our family watched The Passion of the Christ over Easter with the whole family. I personally had not seen it since it first came out. I had to look it up. It was 2004, almost 20 years ago. And you know why I hadn't watched it again? It's it's too intense. It is hard to watch. It's visceral, the suffering, the mocking, the injustice. It is painful. We had one of our kids left the room at one of the part. It was just too much. And it goes beyond just the gore. But it's that you get that personal feeling, the recognition, that's my sin that he was scourged for. That's my sin that drove him up there. And he willingly went through all that, and he suffered in silence. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's our calling, men. That serves as a check on my own behavior at home when my pride, my desire to be right, my selfishness gets in the way. This is where I go back to. Not perfectly. It takes a while sometimes. Eric and I had an argument just last week, and I knew that I was wrong as we were arguing, uh, but my pride was so much that I just couldn't, I couldn't admit it. She knew I was wrong. I knew I was wrong. I don't know who I thought I was fooling, and it just, and honestly, it took till our pastor's meetings the next day, and I had to call her on the way to work to say, gosh, I was wrong, and you knew I was wrong, and would you forgive me? So it's not perfect, but this is what I go back to when I get stubborn. God's bring me this verse. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. What was too much for Christ to give? Nothing. He gave all of it. One example I find of this, you guys remember the Missouri, uh, Joplin tornado in 2011? This story here, uh, as the roaring winds of the 200-mile-an-hour tornado ripped through Joplin, Missouri, Don Lansaw did everything he could to protect his wife. Bethany revealed today that as the devastating tornado tore their home apart, her husband, 31, threw his body over her in the bathtub to cover her. You can see the tub there with their house torn up around it. He got on top of me to take the brunt of most of it, and he's my hero, she said. I mean, the house was ripping apart. It all happened so fast. All the pillows were flying off of us. The only thing I managed to do was keep one in front of my face. As the winds died down, Mrs. Lansall looked up to see her husband was turning blue. Hoping she could still save him, she flagged down a pickup truck to get help finding an ambulance, but it was too late. After six years of marriage, her childhood sweetheart had died. Most of us men will not be cover, called to cover our wife during a tornado and physically die. I hope we would have the courage to do it. But we will be called to sacrifice. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's free time. Maybe it's a job opportunity that would be harmful to your family. Maybe it's your calendar. It's certainly your checkbook, as we all know, being married. But when our model is Christ, and we go back to what did Christ give for me? Everything. What did I deserve? Nothing. It makes that a little bit easier to say, I have this partner that I'm willing to sacrifice for and give up to. Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So again, this is a continuation of how did Christ love the church, and why did Christ give himself up? For us to be established at his church. Our God is holy and our God is just. And our God cannot be around sin and we have all sinned, each one of us, and that's separated us from God for all eternity. Yet he sent his son to die to cleanse us as we see there. So he might present us without spot and without wrinkle. What an encouraging passage this is. If we want to leave behind the the filth of this life and our bad decisions and our sin, Christ calls you to come to us. We acknowledge we've fallen short. We ask him for his forgiveness And we turn from the path around and follow him. It's as simple as that. And we instantly, that's what I love about this passage, we become holy and without blemish in his eyes today. So then he goes to verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. In the same way, again, we are giving a model to follow. And what do we first hear when we think about submission? We think about a dictator or somebody telling somebody what to do, and that is not the picture here at all. This is a man 
partnering his life after Christ, recognizing we are two that have become one, and then treating his wife as if they are the same person. We all take good care of ourselves. That's really what they are. This is a pretty radical idea. Remember, marriage was ordained from God from the beginning of human history. And the way he sees it, the husband treats his wife as if they're actually one flesh. It's very easy to focus on ourselves in this life. This comes easy, doesn't it? Anyone that says kids are naturally good, you've heard this. Kids are generally good. They have never met a toddler. Kids are not good. What are kids' default method? What's the first word? Mine. Usually after mom, sometimes dad, because I think it's dad's easier to say. I've never admitted that. I think all our kids said dad first because it's me. It's because dad's easier. Mine. That's the first word. And we're not that much better as we grow up. Maybe we hide it a little bit better, uh, but it's the same when it comes to relationship. Uh, Rory shared this helpful tip many moons ago. We were still back out uh, north there. Because our default mode is selfishness and on us, when we think things are 50-50, they are not 50-50. We think we're doing far more of the work than we really are. If you really want to be balanced, I found this awesome pie chart. I made it. Isn't this cool? 90-10, that's where you need to be. You should feel like you are doing 90% of the work. And if you feel like you're doing 90% of the work because we're selfish and we think we're better than we are, then you're probably about 50-50. So if you're at 90% and your spouse is at 90%, then you're probably balanced. This isn't just for husbands and wives. This would be for small groups. This would be for your roommate. If you're the one saying, man, I wish my roommate would do this, this, and this, and I do all this stuff on there, uh, you're probably not right. There's probably some error in there. So that's how we should apply this. And when we go a little further, we do a little bit more. That's how Christ loved us, right? He didn't expect us to be 50-50. He didn't say, hey, go clean yourself up and then come talk to me and then I'll deal with it. Come as you are, bring what you have, and then he makes it great. Verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This last section kind of brings us back to the beginning, which is why I love this passage so much. This is a profound mystery, but our joining together in marriage, it's far more than a ceremony and a certificate. It's a picture of Christ and the church is what he tells us. It's a permanent bond. There's a spiritual component beyond even what we can see here today. That's why he gave us marriage, to give us a viewpoint into what this relationship could be like in a very small, imperfect picture of how we will relate Christ and the church and us as part of the church. That's the foundation for this relationship. Christ made a way for each of us to be in fellowship with him, and then through our fellowship with him, then men, we can love his wife, we can love our wives as he loved us, and then wives can love her husband in the same way. The bar is much higher for the men. I think that's part of the reason this passage gets a bad rap is it feels to be anti-women, and it's, it's really not. If your husband is loving you in the way that Christ loved the church, it will be very easy for you to follow along and to let him lead. Same thing, women, if you are supporting your husband, it makes it easier for him to lead out. And again, that's, none of that is done through us. It's all done through the Holy Spirit. It's done through God's covering through his grace, as we talked about today, that gives us the power to leave there. There's always so much more to cover here. Uh, 20, 25 minutes on marriage is not nearly enough. We could study this in perpetuity and never figure it out. From personal experience, Eric and I have been together 25 years. I'm still learning, still making lots and lots of mistakes. Our goal for Sunday morning is really just to hit the high points on what the word says and to give you guys kind of the information but Sunday morning is not enough to really go through this in a detailed way. You really have to dig into the word. You've got to look at these other passages. You've got to study it. And this is one of the reasons why we like small groups so much. Small group is a great time to go through this and say, some of you have questions. What about this? You left that thing out. I know. I wish I could cover all of it, but then we'd be here way past the time we have to leave and you guys get mad at me. So you have other stuff to do. So this is where you go through that and you start, well, what about this? And, you know, oh, he said that, but he really meant this and going through that. So I'd encourage you guys to not let this to be the beginning and not the end. When we think about our roles in husbands and wife, I don't think it needs to be contentious. Uh, my wife and I, we both have strong opinions on many things. And guess what? 99% of the time, we agree on the things that matter. The things that don't matter, if she's got a strong opinion and I don't, great. If I got a strong opinion and she doesn't, great. 
There's no, there's no submission role leading in that part. But there are times we, we work through things, we come to a different spot. So we do follow a process, again, not perfectly. So we discuss together. We talk about it, see where we're at. Most of the time, we agree, move forward. If we don't agree, we go to the Bible. What's the word say? And then we pray about it. My wife is really good about when I have an idea. Have you prayed about that? Oh, well, yeah, for like 10 seconds the other day. Is that enough? <laughs> no, maybe you should spend some time praying about it. We should come back. We talk about it again. We discuss some more. And then again, in the one in 100 times we're still not aligned, I'll usually go get counsel. I'll usually call Trev or somebody else and say, hey, we're working through this thing. Here's kind of what I'm thinking. Am I in error here? And then we come back together again and we work through it. And again, it's very rare that we get to that spot where it's like, hey, I want to go a different path than you do, and we're not fully aligned on it. But I will tell you this, when I follow that process, I strive to love my wife as Christ loved the church, I are on the side of comparing and compassion. Because this, because I know now if I bring something to her and say, hey, honey, this is the way I want to go, that she'll do it. And so for me then, because we've worked through the process, that then brings this extra standard of, hey, I better be right. Like, I can't treat this flippantly, and I can't bring something and say, hey, we're going this way, I'm the leader, and this is what we're doing. That's not the passage. That's not what God teaches us to do. That's not what the Lord modeled. So it gives me pause. I pray again. I want to know, and I want to be confident that God is leading me. Because if I know God's leading me, then I know my wife will follow me, and it'll be great, and it'll work out together. So, and if I'm not sure, then we wait. It's like, all right, we're not ready to make this decision. Let's continue to pray about it and work through it. So, um, let's stop there. That's kind of how we do it. Again, that's not perfect, but that's one example of trusting the process, letting God lead us, because this only works, like Trev talked about last week, it only works when it's covered in the Holy Spirit who is uh, in us and working through us. If we stay in our own flesh, we know where that goes. That goes into the ditch. That's our selfishness. That's me, 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 and not us together. So, um, and again, for men, this is, this is us, a good chance for us to lead in this area. How can you sacrifice your wants, your needs to your wife in the essence of building up this relationship together? Um, okay, let's stop there. God bless you mothers today. Again, you're doing work for the kingdom in your home each day. Every encouraging word, every lunch that you make, every apple that you cut, every load of laundry folded and then sometimes put away um, is really service for the kingdom in your families. And the rest of you remember to call your mom today. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the institution of marriage. We thank you, Lord, that you have defined roles for us, and they're good. And, Lord, if we follow your principles, Lord, they are for uh, us. You gave them for us, Lord, to, um, to give us a plan and, a Lord, a way to move forward. And we pray, Lord, that it be our hearts, Lord. Help each man here today, um, today, tomorrow, next week. Lord, to love his wife as you love us. Lord, I pray for the women that... Um, Lord, they would see their husbands and the role that they have, Lord. They'd be a chief encourager and, um, Lord, just really their support. And, Lord, we thank you for this picture. We pray for strong families. We thank you for the Cahoons and the Savins and their children today, Lord. You just would be with them. And, Lord, guide and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.